pharmacokinetics, which is what the body does to the drug. <coughs> uh, we had just finished talking about um, vocabulary words, if you will. <coughs> Affinity being the strength of attraction of a drug, um, how it's going to <coughs> excuse me, bind with a certain receptor, and then the selectivity, which means that it's going to bind with one receptor versus another. So, for instance, when we start talking about uh, dopaminergic drugs, right, and whether or not they're going to bind one uh, receptor versus another, the uh, kappa versus the mu receptor, for instance, or enter uh, serotonergic drugs. All right, so this will be, I think it's the first drug we've talked about getting into the actual drugs that deal with what you guys are studying on the ground out there. Uh, the GI system, I think, is what you were doing this month. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about proton pump inhibitors. One of the classic ones is omeprazole. So the idea here, guys, is that proton pump inhibitors, a.k.a. PPI, their job is to irreversibly block the um, hydrogen potassium ATPase. These are located, these are enzymes that are located in the parietal cells of the stomach. So looking at the parietal cells, um, specifically they're at that mucus and submucus level. There they have the nickname um, proton pumps because their job is to pump hydrogens into the interior space of the stomach to lower the pH to prepare the stomach for food that is coming. So, <clears throat> excuse me, proton pump inhibitors have a mechanism of action where they bind irreversibly, that is to say, once they are bound, what the body has to do is make another one because this will not become unbound from um, to that particular enzyme. Uh, adverse effects is going to be B12 deficiency, and uh, the reason there is because one of the ways that, well, the way that B12 is separated from its food when it is uh, first uh, passed into the GI system is the low pH. It's the low pH that separates it from the food, allows R factor to come along and grab, allows uh, the B12 to uh, down the line be absorbed into the intestines and go on through the rest of the system. So if there's no acid to disassociate, <coughs> excuse me, the B12 is unavailable and you end up with um, B12 deficiency. And I also have here an adverse effect talking about um, Clostridium difficile or C. diff. I think I have about three more slides coming up that talk about that in a lot more detail. So I'm going to hold off on that one until we get to those, those three slides. Okay, still talking, <coughs> excuse me, still talking about um, GI drugs. So another one that you can use that will lower um, the amount of acid, or shall I say, uh, help to raise the pH uh, inside the stomach is cimetidine. It is an H2 blocker. Its job is to be a, a competitive antagonist. That is to say that it, this drug, competes for the same receptor that histamine does. Okay? Um, it is also acting at the parietal cell, but just in a different place. So your patient comes in and they have I don't know, gastric ulcer, right? Let's just make up a, a, an issue. They have some kind of gastric ulcer. Um, the, gas, the ulcer brings them pain because once acid starts to um, wear through the mucosal and the submucosal level, it gets down to where the nerves are going to be exposed. And once the nerves in that wall, uh, the stomach wall is, exposed, that's where you get that feeling of heartburn, these, the epigastric uh, pain, that kind of thing. So your patient comes in, let's say that they have some kind of gastric ulcer, 
your most immediate job is to try to limit the amount of acid that their, their stomach's going to be exposed to. Now, for instance, proton pump inhibitors, that is the drug that is, has most recently replaced, if you will, H2 blockers. People still use them, but the first line, instead of being H2 blockers, is now a proton pump inhibitor, uh, mostly because of the efficacy of it. Uh, the PPIs are able to eliminate up to 95% of the um, hydrogen ions that are being released into the stomach, and they are effective for up to 48 hours. So you can see how you'd want to go with a PPI and then as an adjunct drug maybe use an H2 blocker. Okay. Let me look over here, make sure I don't have any questions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people told me. My screen is not on. Sorry about that. Thanks, guys. There we go. I have to just start that in the in the beginning, or else I'll forget. Here, I'll just back up. You didn't you didn't miss any pretty pictures though. You missed two slides. It was this one. Proton pump inhibitor. So I was talking about a meprazole here, and this is just the narrative to everything I've been saying that it irre irreversibly blocks the hydrogen potassium ATPase located in the parietal cells, specifically the mucus and submucous layers, uh, and that the adverse effects would be 12 deficiency. And then this is the second slide you missed, that H2 blockers, for example, simididine is a competitive antagonist of histamine, because histamine um, is one of the um, various chemicals the body makes. We'll, we'll look at one, two, three, four, about five of them. Uh, different ways that the body has come up with to make sure it can drop the pH whenever food uh, gets to the stomach. Okay. Peptic ulcer disease. So, uh, for those of you who are in the board review class, you know that we talk about PUD, uh, probably more than you want to hear about it. When, when people say peptic ulcer disease, sometimes they mean in the duodenum and sometimes they mean in the stomach. So you kind of have to, you know, clarify when a person uses that term uh, exactly what it is they're talking about. Factors that increase peptic ulcer disease, H. pylori. Okay. Um, we've got about three... Yeah, three expansive slides on H. pylori. We'll bring up that, that uh, mechanism of action in a few moments. NSAIDs, right? There's a big, I don't get to watch very much TV, but uh, they put me in a hotel uh, today, and I got to see some kind of big um, uh, issue, I guess, that's going on with Tylenol, where they're, they're putting new labels on their bottles to make sure you know that there's acetaminophen in it. Uh, and I guess that had a lot to do with, you know, the effect of NSAIDs or acetaminophen on the gastric lining. Everybody knows that it increases your chance of, of, uh, of gastric ulcers. Acidic agents. So I don't know of any, you know, research that talks about if drinking acidic agents, you know, orange juice, cranberry juice, that kind of thing, increases your chances of peptic ulcer disease, um, I'm sure there's a reason that somebody uh, used this, but uh, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you. Pepsin, we'll talk about that as one of the uh, uh, many uh, endogenous chemicals that the body makes as a way of increasing the uh, proton concentration. Smoking, <clears throat> smoking for a couple of reasons, guys, because one, we think one of the mechanisms is smoking is a vasoconstrictor, <clears throat> excuse me, the nicotine's a vasoconstrictor, and, and not only does it vasoconstrict your periphery, but when you start talking about cutting off 
um, circulation to your, um, your left and right uh, gastric arteries and cutting off circulation to your superior and inferior mesenteric arteries, right? Those are the ones that are responsible for sending blood flow to um, your, the, the uh, stomach proper. So if the stomach loses blood flow, then you get necrosis of those cells. Necrosis of those cells mean they start sloughing off inside the stomach. Therefore, they are exposed now to the acid that's in there. The nerves are exposed, and bad things happen. Um, factors decreasing peptic ulcer um, incident, mucus production. So, um, yeah, there are some drugs that we might use that uh, increase uh, mucus production. We'll talk about one. I think it's the next to the last slide. Uh, in this, yeah, it's the next to the last slide in this lecture, I believe. Um, and what it is is a synthetic prostaglandin E1 drug. One of the ways that it works is by increasing mucus production, and that mucus production uh, would would uh, protect the stomach. Buffers, um, those are just the natural body buffers. We've talked before in class how the body has the job of producing 20 times more base than it does acid because it knows that it will produce a lot of acid just through pure uh, metabolism. Blood flow, we just talked about that. And prostaglandins, we just talked about that. All right, so let's move on. All right, so here's a nice picture. And I like this picture because it goes a long way towards just kind of giving you an opportunity to just look at one photo and see the one, two, three, four, four main ways that the body regulates gastric acid. So, you know, my little pin here. So stomach lumen is over here, right? That's the lumen of the stomach. So all your food's right in here, right? Got all our food in here. Now, we've got a couple of ways. This is that, this is that hydrogen potassium ATPase, the proton pump that we were just talking about. PPIs inhibit, proton pump inhibitors inhibit. So notice that what you have is a hydrogen going into the lumen for every potassium coming out of the lumen. So it's basically maintaining an, a, um, an, electro, an electrochemical charge, of a, a balance in the charge of one hydrogen for one potassium. Now, how do we get this pump going? Let's start up at the top. We could use acetylcholine. Where does that come from? Uh, I don't know. One of the ways, one of the places it'll come is way back here on that back wall. It's a little nerve everybody's familiar with, the uh, vagus nerve, right? Number 10, vagal nerve number 10, that is. So the vagus nerve uses acetylcholine to speak to, yes, the stomach in specific, but if you want to get a better idea of, of how the system works, the vagus nerve uses acetylcholine to speak to the parasympathetic nervous system. All right? That acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system. So one of those things that is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system is the stomach. When we go into parasympathetic tone, that means we're going to rest or rest and digest, which means we need to increase our concentration of acid in the stomach. Okay? So rest and digest. Vagus nerve sends out acetylcholine. It speaks to the muscarinic receptors. 
on the parietal cells in the stomach tells them to get the uh, proton pump going. Now, that can be blocked by this drug, tyrosine, and we'll talk about that a little in detail down the line. All right, first way to secrete acid, acetylcholine. Second way to secrete acid, histamine. That's the one we just talked about, the H2 blocker. Okay, so histamine binds with its H2 blocker, and that receptor upregulates the activity of the proton pump. That we just finished talking about is blocked by drugs like cimetidine. Third way, <clears throat> excuse me, PG is for prostaglandin. Prostaglandin speaks to its receptor. And then prostaglandin uses, uh, we'll look at the details in a few slides, but prostaglandin uses a second messenger uh, mode of speaking to the cells. Okay? It uses um, adenylate cyclase, which speaks to cyclic A and P, which speaks to the proton pump. Okay? That is blocked by misoprostol. Um, misoprostol is the synthetic prostaglandin E1 that I mentioned a little bit earlier. You might recognize it. Uh, uh, it's, it's used for other things. OBGYN, um, it's used for uh, as an abortive facient. Um, and we'll mention some of the other uses of it. Okay, but that's the third way that we can get acid going into the lumen. Let's talk about the fourth way, gastrin. So you just, if gastrin binds its own receptors, that upregulates how much um, um, the, a, the hydrogen potassium ATPase pump is working. Alrighty? These, so these four ways are worth memorizing because most of the drugs that we'll talk about with regard to the GI section will work either directly or indirectly through these mechanisms, these receptors. All right, one moment, let me just peek over, see if I've got any questions. And there's a question, please explain the negative by the pros. Yeah, so that question is about, let me get another. Uh, what's a good color? Red. Okay. There we go. So. This person is asking about this negative. So the idea here is, I was saying that normally prostaglandins um, work through second messengers. So adenylate cyclase. So you would, it's a G protein coupled receptor. So we have that serpentine thing going on up here, which. affects adenylate cyclase, which affects cyclic AMP. Sorry, I know that's terrible writing. So this negative here refers to the fact that when it's when the the original 
prostaglandin is working, it works by downregulating the adenylate cyclate, which then affects the cyclic AMP in a way that it turns on the proton pump. So what I'm saying is the negative does not apply to this. It's, it's not that it's not that prostaglandin negatively impacts the proton pump. It's that prostaglandin negatively impacts part of the second messenger system, which then positively affects the proton pump. Yeah, good question, but I don't I don't think I would have drawn that as a negative if I were there. All right. H2 receptor antagonist. Uh, I think we just saw pretty pictures of that. The idea here is that there's no effect on the H1 receptors. So in the language of, of farm, we would say that it has selectivity for H2. And then they're giving you a nice market name for cimetidine, which is tagamate. Okay, so just talking about some of the reasons that we might use receptor antagonists, the H2s. So again, PUD, sometimes we can have something going on in the duodenum, specifically. Um, remember that once you swallow food and um, then it comes into the stomach, it leaves the stomach and the first place it hits is the duodenum, and that's the trigger for the pancreas uh, to release um, bicarb. Right, so you know, what if you have some problems going on in your pancreas? What if you have a blocked duct, or I don't know, pancreatic cancer, or just something going on with your, your pancreas, and therefore do not get that high level of, of bicarb being secreted into that first part of the duodenum? Then what you end up with is uh, an overconcentration for you know extended periods of time. Uh, of acid being in your duodenum, leading to PUD. Same thing applies as what we just talked about, having some kind of gastric ulcer. GERD, um, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, so remember that as the esophagus comes down to the stomach, there is a lower esophageal sphincter that sometimes is weakened. And once it gets weakened, you have stomach acid that regurgitates, it, it flows backwards into the uh, esophagus, causing um, epigastric burning, heartburn, all those kinds of things. These are reasons you would use H2 blockers. And let's see, I think I've already said everything that's on this one when we started out. Um, no new information there, this is just the actual narrative of stuff that I've already said. Which is, you know, it's a good point to remind you that uh, the things that are testable are the things that are actually on the slide. So, um, yeah, if, it's, if you see it, then, then it's testable. All right, let's talk a little bit about anticholinergics. So, um, anticholinergics, that deals with the, um, it was the first or the second little picture that we saw just a little earlier, where I said you have um, the vagus nerve sending out uh, acetylcholine, and the acetylcholine is the neural transmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system. So, um, this is just giving us an example of drug Gastro gastrozepine, gastrozepine would be the market name for it. We've already seen it as pyrenzepine, muscarinic receptor antagonist, 
and this is just the narrative to what you heard me babbling about a little bit earlier, that it is uh, acetylcholine's job to affect the parasympathetic nervous system. And this is the uh, prostaglandin, the PGE1, misoprostol, aka cytotec. So why would a person prescribe these drugs? Well, one, if there's some reason that your patient needs to take NSAIDs on a daily basis and they need to take the NSAIDs, then you might prescribe this so that it would protect their stomach uh, from the deleterious uh, effects of it. And it does that in two ways. Uh, like we talked about, one of them is it inhibits the secretion of the gastric acid. This is the adenylate cyclase to the cyclic AMP to the proton pump that we talked about. The other one that's not on here is uh, that it at low doses, misoprostol increases the secretion of mucus. And I left that off because it takes high doses to do what we're talking about here. And that's the one that is usually prescribed. But at low doses, it does increase the, uh, the mucus <coughs> excuse me, secretion, but that's an unintended positive effect. Antacids. So it turns out the ways that antacids work, guys, is it's either one of two ways. Either its job is to simply increase the pH of the gastric environment. <coughs> Excuse me. It just plain old increases the pH, um, and or helps to increase the motility. Just think about it, if I can move stuff along through my stomach faster, it means that whatever is in my stomach, acid, is not staying in there as long. And so the net effect is that your patient is relieved of their symptoms. These are the different forms, hydroxides, aluminum and magnesium. You know, to give you an example with the, with the aluminum, basically what it does is the aluminum form of an antacid would bind with the acid in the stomach and then make another form of a chemical that cannot be metabolized back into acid. And then that is excreted into the urine. With both aluminum and magnesium, the thing that you'd have to worry about, though, is whether or not your patient has any kind of... Um, kidney problems going on because this is going to put a little bit of a load on their kidney needing to excrete some things that they normally don't have to worry about that is aluminum and magnesium all right so we're taking a look at something everybody has heard about before pepto -bismol a.k.a. bismuth salicylate. And bismuth salicylate is a sub-salicylate of salicylic acid, which you know as aspirin. So um, the way that it works, you know, is we've got three modalities. One is anti-inflammatory, one is bactericidal, and the other is antacid. Yeah, who knew Eftopismol did all of that, right? So um, its primary mechanism, at least the way that it's marketed, is antacid, and they market it as antacid that also has mild properties for those other two mechanisms we just spoke about. And let's talk about everybody's favorite topic, laxatives. Let me just peek over. <clears throat> Excuse me, make sure I do not have any 
questions? It is the best over-the-counter medical Pepto. Really? I haven't taken it in a long time. But uh, I assume it's still pink. I remember one of the adverse effects are uh, black stool. I don't remember why, but that it can give you black stool. All right, so <clears throat> we'll talk about a few different kinds of laxatives. Bulk forming, surfactants, stimulants, and osmotics. And you can pretty much look at the name of it, and it, you know I could probably skip that section. Uh, and you could tell what the mechanism of it because they are well named. But let's go ahead and do it anyway. Bulk forming. So the idea is. Um, Remember when food is moving through that the small intestine's job is to take away the nutrients and the uh, large intestine's job is for reabsorption of water? So let's say that um, you have a stool moving through your large intestine and you don't have enough water in it because either you're dehydrated or many of the reasons that you would have constipation. So uh, bulk, forming lax uh, bulk forming laxatives will absorb water, starting up here, they absorb water into the stool, which is going to not only soften the stool, but enlarge the stool, <coughs> excuse me, which actually engages two mechanisms. One, yes, it's softer, so it can move through the lumen. But as importantly, the fact that it is larger means that it is going to engage peristalsis then. Okay? So now that it's large enough, we're going to have peristalsis and the stool being pushed through the lumen. Two examples of that, citrusel or the more popular metamucil. All right. Surfactant laxative. So when I say the word surfactant, guys, you kind of pretty much all really know where I'm going. That <clears throat> just like when we talk about surfactant in the lungs, its job is to reduce the surface tension. So surfactants with regard to laxatives, it does also reduce the surface tension, but towards the goal of allowing that, that layer of water on the surface of the stool to break their bonds so that they're more so that the water is more easily absorbed into the stool itself. Because think about it. Otherwise, the only thing that we'd have to depend on is the osmotic pressure of the stool, right? Water following stuff. The stool trying to pull water into it just because of its its stuff that's in there, uh, especially the undissolved salts. Well, this allows, um, uh, if you break, if you lower the surface tension, it means that you do not have to have as much osmotic tension pulling the water inside. And one example is uh -oh. colace. Uh, I think that's probably the one you'll see on your rounds uh, in the hospital the most. At least I never saw anything else but colace. Okay, that takes us to the <coughs> excuse me stimulant laxatives. So, um, the stimulant laxatives work because <coughs> they are going to stimulate peristalsis. Um, the idea is that they not only increase the water but also the electrolytes that are being secreted into the lumen. It does this upon contact with the lumen. Okay. So this particular chemical, it's actually a pro, um, um, it's better called a pro-medicine, right? Which is to say that when you swallow it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't change into its active form until it hits the acidity of the stomach. When it does, 
then it changes into its active form. That active form, when it is absorbed and comes into contact with the nerves in the stomach, then that stimulates the peristalsis and the water and electrolyte secretion back into the liver. Okay. And the examples are Ducalax and Correctol. I think they're, well, no, Exlax is probably the most famous one. I can't remember. Oh, it was in New York. I saw the Exlax headquarters a few years ago in New York, and I was just strolling along, minding my own business. It was just the most ironic thing. It was this, this building that had a huge sign on it. The letters were in brass. I mean, each, each of these letters were probably about three feet tall, and they were in this shiny brass. And it said Exlax. It just, it was just kind of a funny thing to see. I just never expected Exlax to kind of put itself out there like that. But hey, I mean, <laughs> I guess they're proud. All right, osmotic laxatives. So you kind of know what we're getting at here already, right? Uh, osmotic laxatives, they have the mechanism of using salts that are not going to be um, absorbed into the intestines. They're going to remain in the fecal matter. So you swallow this, this, this milk of magnesia. It goes through your small intestine where other salts may be reabsorbed along with nutrients, these particular salts are not. So by the time it reaches your large intestine, they're still there. And it, by the power of um, osmotic pressure, uh, it tries to pull the water back into the lumen and prevent it from being reabsorbed out of the large intestine. Okay, let me just double check for any questions. Yes, I agree with you. It is gross. All righty, so osmotic laxatives in another form. Um, I just told you about the salts. I wanted to include this one because it's about the sugars. You can do the same. It's the same principle. You, you load up the drug with, you load up the laxative with non-digestible sugars. Um, uh, most popular being a synthetic disaccharide. It is immune to the intestinal disaccharidase, never gets broken down, and then you still have the same effect, uh, but you end up having um, you end up having the, the osmotic pressure being generated by larger molecules of sugar instead of the smaller salt molecules. These are the example. <coughs> excuse me. These are the examples. And then at the bottom here of the screen is a third modality, which is polyethylene glycol electrolyte solutions. And um, also known as microgels. So if you will, you know, it's, it's on a continuum from what we've just talked about. We started talking about one, you know, little salt that's not absorbed. Um, to larger sugars that is not absorbed, to linking those larger sugars and just making a gel that's not absorbed. Righty, so it's just getting bigger and bigger on the macro scale. Fecal softeners, also known as emollients. <clears throat> Sodium docusate is both stimulant and softening, which brings up the point that many of these laxatives, um, as I mentioned when I first started talking about laxatives, work by more than one mecha mechanism of action, which is why you can have so many different laxatives, right? You can have one that works only as a uh, osmotic laxative, or you can have one that works as an osmotic laxative and a stimulant. Uh, or you can have one that works as a stimulant and a software, or maybe an osmotic and a software. This is how you get so many brands, because they just sit around and figure out which permutation of laxatives has not been used. Or maybe you add three of them in there. 
You know, it just the list just goes on and on and on. Uh, so this is one of those. Sodium docosate uses uh, the surfactant that we talked about <coughs> and softening. And then the arachis oil enema uh, for impacted feces, and that's basically uh, both lubrication and increasing osmotic pressure. All right, so if we're going to talk about how to get things going when they're stopped, let's talk about how to stop things after they're going. Um, oh, let me go to back there. I see a question. Uh, <clears throat> Michael, yeah, you had the same thought I had when I was making this lecture. Michael says, isn't polyethylene glycol antifreeze? Yeah, because I was like... <clears throat> I remember going mud piles. I memorized mud piles, and part of mud piles had to do with antifreeze. And wait a minute, um, isn't that bad for you? I hear you, Michael. After enough research, it sound it 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 appears that polyethylene glycol is used in many laxatives. I don't know why. Uh, right there, I'd have to refer you to, I guess, Dr. Uh, Tulp's saying, I remember hearing him say once, that the poison is in the dose. <clears throat> Excuse me. I didn't go as far as looking up the difference in the, you know, what level of polyethylene glycol is toxic. Evidently, it makes a difference. As, um, it's not a little known fact. It's not like something only one or two companies do. It is a widespread practice to include it. So, you know, who knew? But great question, great question. I, I, I wonder the same thing. And Zakia says, funny name for peanut oil, a fancy name for peanut oil. Oh, really? The Arrakis oil. Cool. Didn't know that. Thank you. <laughs> they are trying to kill us. <laughs> There's a conspiracy out there somewhere. All right, so uh, <clears throat> anti-diarrheal. So the idea with anti-diarrheal is that um, for me, I'm trying to think. We haven't, yeah, we haven't gone over the types of diarrhea. Um, we do that in the physio class. So I know we haven't gone over the types of diarrhea, but I don't think that will stand in the way of understanding the mechanisms. Uh, if it does, just throw your question out there, and uh, I, I'll, I'll ex expound on it. So anti-diarrheal, uh, what you use really does depend on what kind of diarrhea you have. Uh, so one of the agents for diarrhea uses the mechanism of uh, agonizing, that is activating, potentiating the mu opioid receptor, where it's found in the myenteric plexus of the large intestine. So um, opioids, when they activate the receptor, uh, normally result in a, a decreased tone that is to say, it's not as, uh, the, the large intestine is not as tight, it's not as uh, uh, closed around the fecal matter, which means decreased motility, right? Because if it's going to squeeze the fecal matter through, that means it needs to be able to activate the circular, uh, the linear, and those oblique muscles. So those aren't working so well, therefore it's, it's not really pushing things out, which is what helps with the diarrhea because you don't, you're not voiding uh, with the same frequency. And the fact that this stool is standing still for a much longer time inside of the lumen means that you have um, more time for the liquid that's in it to be reabsorbed out of the large intestine as it should be. Right? Because think about it. When we talk about diarrhea, we're talking about, um, I think it's 200 grams. I'll double check it, but I think we're talking about 200 grams in a day. 
And uh, the idea is that you normally have these, it's not necessary, but you normally have these loosely formed stools. It's loosely formed because the large intestine never got a chance to reabsorb the water out of it like it should have. Lots of reasons. I mean, you might have uh, pseudomembranous colitis, right? That fake membrane that develops with C. diff. You might have, um, uh, I don't know, a whole bunch of reasons. Actually, we'll go over two or three more. So you might have lots of reasons why the large intestine never did get a chance to reabsorb that water. Um, the fact that you can slow it down by agonizing the new opioid receptors means that uh, it'll have more time to do that. Little wonder why one of the adverse effects of opioids is constipation, right? Okay, let's go. So here is an image of exactly where these these um, opioid agonists work. So remember, if we start, with, this is the lumen in here. And as we move out, we have that mucosal layer, excuse me, which, yeah, you can see it here. Right, so we have the mucosal layer. And the idea is we want to move all the way back. We're going, working our way from inside to outside. So we have our mucosal layer, and we have our submucosal layer here. That's a bad color. Okay, in red, mucosal, submucosal, and then just distal, working its way out. I should say superficial. Just superficial to the submucosal layer is the submucosal plexus. These little yellow things here. And just superficial to that right here. This is where that lap are that uh, anti diuretic anti diarrhea medicine would be working. The Mayan plexus. Okay, so that tells you that it needs to be soluble enough to be absorbed through these layers to make it to those nerves. And to the point that we talked about before, let me erase this. So we talked about one of the ways that, that you, you, one of the reasons you feel pain when you have ulcers is because this layer, this layer, this layer are all worn away. When you start getting acid coming into contact with this submucosal plexus. So it wears through from the inside to the outside, from deep to superficial. All of these layers, the mucosal layer and the submucosal layer, until it gets to that submucosal plexus, and that is what's causing the pain when, uh, you know, people go, oh, I'm getting stressed and my ulcer is acting up. That's the mechanism right there. Um, mesentery, just a reminder of that. The, med, the job of the mesentery, remember we have the super, uh, superior mesenteric artery, inferior mesenteric artery. The job of the mesentery is to attach uh, the intestines to the back wall. There are places where there are two levels here, and they are split by blood vessels, and nerves running in between them, okay? Um, 
This is that area that I mentioned earlier when I talked about how one of the ways that smoking contributes to uh, gastric, well, not only just gastric cancer, but um, ulcers, that it's these arteries that also get constricted, these mesenteric arteries, whose job it is to supply the blood here. Okay? All right, let me double check for any questions. None. So shall we move on. All right, anti emetics. So, what does that mean? That means I want to puke, and you're going to give me a drug to keep me from doing it. There are four drugs that you can give me to keep me from vomiting. Well, before that, let's talk about why we vomit. I mean, so there's a couple of different reasons to vomit. Let's say that I swallow something. Um, yeah, let's say I swallow something, and whatever this microorganism is starts to secrete a toxin. And that toxin gets absorbed into my blood system and sooner or later reaches the chemotactic area in my brain. So when that toxin in its concentration reaches the chemotactic area on the floor of my fourth ventricle and the posterior wall, you do not have to know that, then my brain says, don't know what this is, but it's present in high enough concentrations that I am going to engage your motor um, nerves and get that stuff out. We're going to put everything in reverse. Instead of swallowing down the esophagus, we're going to have retrograde motion and get it going back up. Okay, so that's one way, engaging the, te the chemotaxis uh, center. Uh, another way would be just simply having a high concentration of something in your stomach uh, that sits in one place for a while. So um, I swallow something, it gets, uh, it makes it to my stomach proper, uh, but for some reason I have delayed emptying. So when I have this high concentration of stuff, it may not be the concentration, it just may be how long that particular concentration has remained in contact with the lining of my stomach, and that causes me to vomit. So, um, and there's also noxious smells uh, that also go to the brain to make you vomit. And those are the three big ones. Okay, so that said, uh, we will approach now the four different ways to counteract those mechanisms of vomiting. So serotonin antagonists. So if you've got a patient who's taking chemotherapy and the chemotherapy is causing them to vomit, then basically the idea is you are antagonizing, you are blocking serotonin receptors. Zofran is the drug, and the advantage of Zofran is that it does not um, bind to dopamine receptors. Okay, so who cares, right? Well, you care because it means your patient isn't going to suffer extrapyramidal side effects. Um, Whenever we're talking about dopamine, dopamine and dopamine analogs, um, you know, we always end up talking about these extra pyramidal side effects. An oversimplified way of looking at it, guys, is that um, the pyramidal system includes the pyramids, and it includes um, 
what else is it's the pyramids and the medulla and the idea is that the pyramidal system is pretty much responsible for movement just movement I don't want to say purposeful versus reflex I'm oversimplifying it to say it's responsible for movement where the extra pyramidal is responsible for fine-tuning that movement okay so the idea here is to have extra pyramidal side effects would mean that instead of just blocking serotonin receptors if a drug was going to have extra pyramidal side effects it would also block the dopamine receptors in the substantia nigra which should remind you of a disease called Parkinson's. So therefore, the job of dopamine in the substantia nigra is to calibrate the movements that you are normally able to start with your pyramidal system. The extra pyramidal system calibrates it. That's why you end up with that four hertz tremor for Parkinson's because uh, and the bradykinesia, the, you know, the, the very slow uh, cogwheel-like movements because you are no longer able to calibrate your gross movements because your extra pyramidal system has been affected. So pyramidal is about movement, extra pyramidal is about calibrating those movements. Okay, let's stop for a moment. We will check for some questions. We had none. We do a time check. All righty, we got about 10 minutes. All righty, moving on. Um, what is this? This is what I just said. So, extrapyramidal syndrome happens because of the blockade of dopamine receptors in the basal ganglia, specifically substantia nigra, leading to Parkinson-like symptoms such as slow movement, bradykinesia, stiffness, and tremor. And you know that, I, I mentioned earlier, 4 hertz. It's 4 hertz because it's a 4 hertz tremor. There, there is a difference in the, um, the shakes that you might see in an alcoholic versus, um, um, I don't know, the, the myoclonic jerks that you might see in an epileptic versus the um, trembling that you might see in a person who's suffering from a cold injury. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, those are totally different frequencies than the 4 hertz frequency that you would see in a Parkinson's patient. Um, just keep your eyes open next time you're in a Kmart or a Target somewhere, and you can you can really recognize the difference. Four hertz is not that fast when you're looking at it. But once you see it, you'll be able to recognize it each time. Okay, so we talked about the serotonin antagonist. <clears throat> Let's talk more about dopamine antagonist. The two that you'll hear about more as an antiemetic. Are going to be composine and finagrin. Okay, so um, one of the things we should worry about with with a dopamine agonist. Well, if we go back to our endocrine system, one of the things you will probably remember is that that. Uh, Dopamine, one of its jobs is to inhibit lactation, right? So if we antagonize dopamine, if we take away the dopamine, one of the side effects is we allow lactation to begin. So uh, that, that would probably be one of the adverse effects of a dopamine antagonist. Let's look here. Yep, Haldol. And Reglan. 
and those are because um, the we we just talked about the pyramidal system and the extra pyramidal system. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the things that's included in the extra pyramidal system um, is this is that part of your brain which has to do with uh, maintaining consciousness and how doll affects that extra pyramidal or that part of the extra pyramidal system. So you get the dangerous patient that comes in and they're out of control and if you've been working at 2 a.m. in an emergency room and they're trying to get the patient quiet, it's how doll that they're going to be giving you. So double check for any questions. Alrighty. We have none. And we'll go back. And then the one that all of the Denver, Colorado people are crazy over right now. THC, the tetrahydrocannabinol, active ingredient in marijuana. Also in the synthetic marinol, it acts as an anti-emetic with a, as they say in research, an incompletely understood mechanism of action. And I do believe the United States Department of Justice has just agreed to not prosecute anyone for handling small amounts. I don't know what the threshold is, where you go from small to large. Uh, but they basically say that as long as the states don't get in the federal government's way, the federal government won't get in the state's way. So there you go. We have another drug for using or for preventing vomiting. Yahoo! One of our students says. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about NSAIDs. We've got about five minutes. Let me take a peek. I want to make sure we end in a in an appropriate slide. H. pylori, H. pylori insects. Okay. So. With regard to NSAIDs, um, when we think about them, excuse me, we have to think about three mechanisms. Anti-inflammatory, anti, -inflammatory, anti uh, well, I'm sorry, analgesic takes away the pain, and antipyretic takes away the fever. Okay? Now, we will talk about how NSAIDs can inhibit COX activity, is cyclooxygenase, uh, cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2, um, or as they, they said when I studied this topic in Italy in my Italian laboratory, cyclooxygenase, it just made it sound so nice. So we will talk about cyclooxygenase 2 and I don't know the word for one in Italian, sorry. Uh, something like that. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about both of those. We're going to go back to this topic of prostaglandin synthesis, where reducing prostaglandin synthesis, COX-1, reduces mucus reduces bicarbonate, blood flow, cell proliferation, and increases acid secretion. Well, duh, kind of makes it a lot easier to see why NSAIDs have such a high 
propensity for causing ulcers, right? Why Tylenol needed to put that uh, warning on the top of their caps in huge letters this week. Is there anything you could do if you were trying to purposely cause ulcers in the stomach? Other than these few things here, decreasing the mucus, I have less bicarbonate, I have less blood flow, I don't have many cells growing to replace the ones I'm destroying because of the three above things. And oh yeah, let's just go ahead and dump a whole lot more acid in there. Okay? Uh, so, that is where we will end tonight. We will pick up with this section here next week because we're going to talk, we've got to do a little introduction about uh, biliary excretion, where it's made, etc. All righty? So there you go, guys. You've done it one more time. You had wasted 90 minutes of your perfect life with me. Hope you got something out of it. I really do hope it's helpful for the tests. And um, I will be talking to you again about a week from today. So I'm wishing you a wonderful rest of your holiday. Thanks for joining me, even in the midst of your holiday.